So my name is Riccardo Scholfi. I work in Italy at the National Institute for Astrophysics in Padova. And first of all, I would like to thank again Manuel and all the other organizers for this very nice uh, workshop, very useful. And today I'm going to talk about uh, I'm continuing the discussion on binary star mergers and related phenomena of short gamma repairs and kilonova, on which a lot has been said already in previous talks. And uh, of course, a good part of this will refer to our breakthrough uh, event, this first multi messenger observation of a binary star merger in 2017. And uh, as we uh, heard and we reminded, this uh, led to uh, a number of discoveries. And among them also the confirmation of very important uh, uh, theoretical predictions, including the connection between sh uh, binary star mergers and this phenomenon of short gamma repairs and kill node. Uh, but at the same time, this uh, also left behind very important urgent questions, which now call for a deeper uh, theoretical investigation. And in this context, uh, we obtained some uh, results, in particular in the last few months, which I uh, wish to talk about. And most of what I'm going to say refer to the papers that you see here. Uh, so that's the basic reference in case you want to know more. Okay, so I start the, uh, our famous event, GW 17 uh, the first binary star merger detecting gravitational waves as well as electromagnetic signals. And here I just repeat a bit the uh, timeline of the event. So we have the merger first, detecting uh, by LIGO Virgo detectors, then a peculiar uh, gamma ray burst, GRB 1717A, and then much later, around 11 hours, the discovery of the optical infrared counterpart, which relates to the kilonova, that was also crucial to pinpoint the host galaxy. And then we have uh, also, see, uh, reminded about this, uh, this afterglow radiation, X-ray and radio emerging nine and 16 days after merger, but as we heard, uh, this will continue to provide uh, additional key information later also in the optical band for actually for several months. And the combination of this afterglow radiation with the initial gamma rays, as we uh, explained to us uh, very nicely, uh, eventually led to um, the identification of this as a, say, canonical short gamma ray burst with uh, a powerful jet, which was, however, in this case, pointing away from us by Third, uh, 15 to 30 degrees. So this was a confirmation in the end that a uh, binary star merger can produce uh, short gamma ray burst like the others that we know. And this was certainly a great success, but also left behind, as I said, a uh, very important open question. And well, to begin with, we still don't know uh, exactly how a binary star merger remnant can launch a jet in the first place. And also for this event, uh, the most likely scenario is that uh, a massive uh, metastable neutral star was produced, which eventually collapsed to a black hole. But we don't know whether the jet was launched before or after the collapse. So in other words, we don't know if the central engine was, in this case, a massive neutral star or the accreting black hole. And so this is where uh, really binary star merger simulation became crucial, really the tool to understand the uh, physical conditions and mechanisms to power a jet. One of the things that we learned uh, in recent years is that one of the proposed mechanisms based on neutrino antineutrino annihilation as the main energy uh, source uh, is probably not powerful enough. And we are instead now converging to the idea that magnetic fields should be the main driver. And in this case, if you want to study uh, jet formation, you need to do GRMHD simulation of magnetized binary star merger. And this is something on which uh, uh, various groups uh, that are also well represented here in this workshop are uh, at work, are working on. So until recent times, most of the um, effort was devoted to the black hole scenario. In this case, you expect the formation of a black hole accretion disk system uh, a few tens of milliseconds after merger. And for typical um, mass, uh, disk mass of 0.1, uh, solar masses and for high enough magnetization, this system has in principle all the ingredients to launch an accretion power jet via the Blanfosnaic mechanism and where uh, the ultimate uh, source, the ultimate energy reservoir is the rotational energy of the black hole itself channeled via the magnetic field. And this is a very promising mechanism that was that is also considered in other contexts like AGNs. So for this channel, um, the 
results obtained so far in uh, binary star measure simulation are, at least in my opinion, encouraging. And here I want to mention again uh, um, the, the work uh, here on the uh, bottom left uh, by Ruse et al. in 2016 that we heard from the Milton talk yesterday that was the first to show the formation of a collimated outflow along the black hole uh, spin axis, uh, magnetically dominated and only mildly relativistic, but with properties that in principle could evolve into a proper jet with high Lorentz factor and sufficient luminosity. So um, I think we all agree that uh, we still don't have all, uh, like the demonstration that everything really goes as it should, uh, but this is certainly a promising scenario that is currently under investigation. Of the other scenario. Well, until uh, recent addressing jet uh, this was um, quite ignored. And uh, in 2017, we decided to start a systematic investigation. And we continued to work on this. Uh, we made some progress until the recent results uh, obtained earlier this year. And this is now what I want to talk about in more detail. So in uh, his talk yesterday, uh, Jay already introduced the physical and numerical setup of a simulation. So I will skip that and go directly to the, to the outcome. Uh, already from our uh, 2019 paper, where we explored 100 millisecond of evolution of our massive neutral star remnants, uh, we, we have seen that the magnetic field, uh, say the dynamics of the system, not only amplifies the magnetic field, but can also uh, gradually shape and uh, modify its geometry, reorganize the field structure. And this could eventually lead to the formation of helical structures along the spin axis, which is a very important ingredient in the context of uh, jet formation. And the other important element that also Jay pointed out is that uh, the merger process heats up the remnant, and this leads to uh, the ejection of material from the outer layers of the remnant. Uh, polluting the, the environment around. And what we found is that in presence of a strong magnetic field, due to the additional contribution of magnetic pressure, we can have a much enhanced uh, outflows and also uh, more isotropic outflows. And here on top uh, right, I show the uh, large uh, meridional view at the end of the simulation to the, towards the end. Uh, so we have the density, we see that there is this pattern pollution everywhere and we also see if you look at the green part that up to 400 500 kilometers this is also rather isotropic and on the bottom left we have a cumulative mass uh, flow across 150 kilometer radius and we see that after um, besides the initial contribution of dynamical ejecta which is uh, not much affected by magnetic fields that the post-merger mass outflow are very much enhanced in presence of a strong magnetic field so why is this so important? Because if at later times an incipient jet forms and tries to propagate along the axis, this uh, amount, this cloud, dense cloud of material around will constitute an obstacle that opposes the propagation of the jet. And if this is dense and massive enough, could even prevent further jet development uh, entirely, which means that no short gamma bursts can be produced. And this is different from the black hole case where the funnel along the spin axis has a much lower density. So in that case, uh, it's much easier for an incipient jet to uh, travel through. Uh, so at the end of this simulation, we, uh, after 100 milliseconds, we had no signs of jet formation. And this made us quite pessimistic about the possibility of launching a jet. And this brings us to the more recent work here we perform two new simulations with a binary star with a chirp mass consistent with the 17 and 17 event, mass ratio of 0.9. And they differ just for the initial magnetization uh, with a maximum magnetic field strength of one or five in 10 to 15 Gauss. And most importantly, uh, in this case, we, um, we got more ambitious and we performed the evolution up to 250 milliseconds after merger, which is more than twice as much compared to our previous best. And this was quite an effort, but it paid off because in this case, for the higher magnetic field model, uh, we are seeing something different happening, something new.
And here I show a snap component of angular velocity. So it's actually, if you see blue, it means that your outflow is fast enough to uh, overcome the gravitational pull and will become unbound. While in the red, you see material that um, is bound, then uh, in the end, it will fall back towards the center. And we use this quantity because it allows to clearly distinguish a faster outflow with a, a slower outflow. And here the scale is much, uh, is uh, very large, it's uh, more than 3,000 kilometers. And the times are 100, 170, and 210 milliseconds after merging. And up to 100 milliseconds, we have seen uh, uh, essentially the same type of evolution that we obtained before. So you can see this in the top uh, left, where we have uh, magnetic field amplification, the creation of this isotropic uh, barium polluted environment. But then at 100 milliseconds, we also see, if you look in the bottom left, that something is, not, is happening. A, a collimated outflow is going to be produced along the spin axis of the remnant. And in an, uh, another 100 millisecond, this outflow breaks out of the slower surrounding material and uh, then acquires a more definite, more, uh, yeah, definite shape, uh, conical shape of about 15 degrees alpha wane angle. So in this uh, simulation for the first time in a full magnetized binary star merger simulation, we see that also a massive neutral star remnant can produce a collimated outflow. And, and it's interesting to know that in the other case with the lower initial magnetization at 200 milliseconds after merger, we still have no signs of this collimated outflow. So in this case, the opposing effect of the obstacle, so this barium polluted environment wins. And this is telling us that uh, the outcome is not obvious in, uh, so the outcome, the, the fact that the neutral star could produce the collimated outflow is not obvious. It, it depends. So it might be, might not be, depending on the system. Now, if we focus on the case, if we look at the, uh, so we, we had an evolution that is long enough to follow the entire uh, collimated outflow process from the initial propagation up to the time where there is no more power emitted from the central uh, source. And this is something you can see at the last uh, panel on the right, where we see there is no fast, there's not any more fast outflow coming out from the center. And this is not only important to set a sort of time scale for the event, but also because we can study in full the energetics of this uh, collimated outflow. If we look at the uh, bottom left, the top panel, we have the energy of the outflow. And we see that this, so in blue is the total, and then we have the components, kinetic, magnetic, internal, in uh, purple, green, and uh, orange, or yellow. And what we see is that uh, this grows in time, but uh, at some point it saturates. And this happens around 160 milliseconds after merger. Below we have the rotational energy, which is mostly more than 99% resides within the, the bulk of the massive neutral star. And we see uh, a change of behavior also around 160 milliseconds from a rapid decay to some more uh, slower and more linear decay. And in the inset, we see the uh, angular rotation profile uh, so versus the same figure. Uh, so in the in reach the core of the mass. And again, some happens around how at this time, the initial differential rotation in the neutral system, and now we have uh, a uniform rotating core. So putting these things together, we conclude we identify the energy reservoir of our outflow as the differential rotation in the neutral star core. When this is over, then the uh, power source is over. What is then the uh, launching mechanism? The launching mechanism is magnetic rotation. We have differential rotation, amplifying in particular the toroidal field within the neutral star. There is a strong toroidal field amplification, a strong growth of magnetic pressure, and also of a radial gradient of magnetic pressure, in particular along the axis. And this, and this translates into an acceleration that is able to overcome at some point the gravitational pull and launches uh, the jet along the, uh, launches the outflow along the axis. 
And this is also confirmed when we look at the magnetic field structure, where we see here 150 to 100, 250 milliseconds on a scale of almost 3,000 kilometers. And we see the formation of these helical structures that was also uh, discussed yesterday. And here also, Jay noted yesterday that uh, we have also from, from red to gray some isodensity contours showing that uh, the distribution of material around the remnant is still rather isotropic. So there's nothing here like an accretion disk or so. And below, to be more explicit, I also showing the radial gradient of magnetic pressure where blue means acceleration directed outwards. And you see that along the axis, there is a, quite an acceleration. So uh, I think Bernard yesterday was asking for something more quantitative with respect to just looking at the helical field structure. I think uh, this, is, uh, this acceleration here below is a, a good quantitative um, uh, proof that the acceleration is going on there. Okay, so um, basically this confirms the picture that we have. So we have, we think we have understood what is going on here, okay? Uh, also, let me point out that um, one can obtain, uh, uh, can see the same, the analogous um, uh, production of a collimated outflow, so the analogous mechanism at work in a more um, idealized setting. When one has a non-magnetized uh, differential rotating neutral star, and then by hand adds on top a strong dipolar field aligned with the spin axis. And this is done, with, uh, done by a number of studies. And here I'm, also, I'm uh, in particular showing uh, work we did back in 2014 with Daniel. And, uh, but this is also done in more recent work that I mentioned on the right that were also mentioned uh, in the previous talks. So in this case, in all these cases, we produce a collimated outflow. This is ubiquitous. And this is due to the fact that when you have a dipolar field, you put it on the differential rotating neutral star. This will wind up the field. We have a growth of magnetic pressure. We have radial gradients and we accelerate an outflow along the axis. And this makes then the field lines uh, twisted. So we have this helical structure. But the, the thing I want to stress is that in an actual binary star merger, this outcome is not obvious. In the same paper in 2014, we also show that in absence of an order magnetic field, the outflow uh, powered by the, like magnetically driven, so powered by the magnetic pressure is rather isotropic. And this is actually uh, much more uh, close to the uh, situation that we have early after merger. So um, here we see that the, the fact that the helical structure is not there from the beginning, but takes time to emerge, to be produced, leads to an, an earlier stage where we have a, a more isotropic barium pollution, we create an obstacle. And then if and when the uh, collimated outflow is produced, this will be fighting against this obstacle. And this will make it more barium loaded and less, uh, less powerful and if successful at all. So here we have uh, two mechanisms, the obstacle and then the outflow that the collimated outflow that uh, compete against each other, and they are both controlled in a way or another by the magnetic field. So uh, coming to the spicy question, can this outflow that we see reproduce the properties of a short camera burst, and in particular, the one of 17 and 17? The answer for the case at hand is no. So we have an energy and also a collimation that are insufficient to, um, to explain the parameters, the jet parameters that were inferred for the event. But the most uh, critical point is uh, certainly the Lorentz factor. So we have auto velocities up to 20% of the speed of light. And uh, for a short camera burst, we need at the very least a Lorentz factor of 10, which is 0.995 C. And in order to have any chance, any hope to accelerate this outflow up to this Lorentz factor, we need to have a, uh, ratio of energy, total energy flux over mass, rest mass energy flux uh, of about 10. But what we have is less than 0.01. So in other words, we have an outflow that is at, the, at least, at the very least, three orders of magnitude too heavy to be accelerated to something to what we need. So our conclusion is that while the mass neutral star can produce a collimated outflow, and we think we understand how and why, um, they, this will most likely have uh, 
there will be in the properties of these properties needed a short memory bus. So this result tend to favor the alternative scenario where the manager. So just to quickly recap, in one go, we accomplished this. So we did this very long simulation. We showed that we can have this collimated outflow from mass neutral stars, although not all mass neutral stars will produce it. Uh, we studied the full process. So we studied the energetics, the properties, identify the energy reservoir and the launching mechanism. And when compared with uh, the properties required to make a short memory burst, we realized that uh, this scenario is disfavored. So we favor the alternative scenario of a black hole. And of course, this is not the end of the story because our simulation uh, do not include all physical ingredients that are important. And I think in particular about uh, neutrino emission, which might help uh, in particular in the early phase uh, keeping the, um, the density along the funnel, so along the spin axis, lower, and this might help uh, an instant jet uh, propagation. So uh, the big question is, would this effect, uh, will uh, this effect uh, allow to overcome this huge gap be between the properties that we have at the moment and what you need to make a short gamma rate burst? And the only way to know is to do the full magnetized binary star merger simulation, including also neutrinos. So this should be our next step. And uh, outflows of material uh, and uh, the connection. So I can probably slide where I can uh, from the art process. Uh, this slide just to remind that uh, what we observed as a thermal transient, infrared transient, uh, optical infrared um, matched well our broad expectation for a killer nova. So this was another great success, uh, confirming that banister mergers are ideal sites for our process nucleosynthesis. But as for the short gamma burst, this left behind open questions, in particular on the origin of this uh, mass ejection that produced the kilonova. And the, the simplest modeling uh, that one can do um, allows to estimate the mass, velocity, and opacity of a given ejector component uh, to reproduce uh, a certain kilonova with a given peak time, peak uh, uh, luminosity, and also peak frequency or temperature. And using this approach, it was realized that this kilonova is hard to be explained in just one component. It probably requires at least two components, a blue and a red component. And the blue kilonova picked just one day after merger between uh, UV and blue and suggests an, an eject expanding at a 0 0.2, 0 0.3 C with, an, with a mass as high as 1.5 to 2.5 percent of a solar mass and a low opacity of 0 0.5 in CGS. And this low passing suggests that our process in this case couldn't go that far, uh, very far in producing the heaviest elements. The other component, the red kilonova picked several days in the infrared band, um, suggesting ejecta with expansion velocity 0.1 C, so it's lower, but a lot of mass, more than uh, at least 5% uh, of solar mass and a much higher opacity, 10 centimeters square per gram. And this suggests that in this case we have the elements which raise the question we eject mechanism and after merger that can explain this component and the realm of numerical simulation to provide an answer. Uh, we heard uh, yesterday that uh, disks around uh, black holes can produce uh, slow but very massive outflows. And this is um, probably the more, most tempting explanation for the red kilonova. But the blue kilonova is more puzzling. So here we have a rather high velocity, rather high mass. The rather high velocity suggests a more dynamical, so it's hard to explain with the post-merger wind. The high mass is harder to explain with the dynamical ejection process. So we are a bit in between. Different groups pro uh, propose different solutions. And what we consider here is the possibility that magnetically driven winds from the massive neutral star before they collapse the black hole are what produces this 
Ricardo. Uh, Luke Lenovo. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, so yeah. I'm running out of time. You have run out. Okay, so sorry, uh, if this took longer. I get to the point that uh, if we take the velocity and uh, the mass of this uh, unbound material when we have a collimated outflow, we can match the expectations. So uh, our conclusion is that uh, this outflow is not making the jet, but can power the blue kilonova. So, uh, we know of them. We prove metastable mass neutral star providing a second. Did not produce a jet, but uh, provided this uh, magnetically driven wind, which could uh, produce blue killer with some pollution of dynamical ejector. Maybe it should be a black hole with a mass disparate the jet, and uh, the wind from the disk also made the red kilo nova. And this is it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Agnieszka has a question. Uh, yes, hello, uh, Ricardo. Actually, I had a question already during your uh, conclusion, so a, a bit earlier than, than you put them. I wanted to ask, um, why did you exclude the neutrinos as a source of power for the jet? Because you excluded them at the beginning, and then you found that maybe they could provide you the, the higher Lorentz factor. So what is that? Oh, the, okay, the, these are two different things. There are studies uh, trying to see if neutrinos, in particular neutrino anti neutrino annihilation alone, could power the jet. And this study suggests that this is not sufficient. This is probably not powerful now. So the working hypothesis here is that the magnetic field is the main driver. That neutrinos might help, but magnetic fields are the main driver. This is the working hypothesis, which tells you that you need Jeremy's simulation. Then the fact that we don't have neutrinos is a different story. This is a technological uh, lack of technology, if you want. So we, I, I wish to have neutrinos. In this case, I don't have. And I think my most important next step is to add neutrinos because they can clean up uh, better. So neutrinos alone will not be powerful enough to make the jet, but maybe they help the magnetically driven jet to come out more powerful. And then maybe this could match the short memory bars requirement. Yes, of course. Thank you. This, of course, depends on the efficiency of this annihilation, which is poorly constrained, but I hope that... Right. Uh, this needs to be studied in full, combining both effects. Okay. Thank and you. Yeah, Lord is next. Uh, thank you, thank you. Very interesting talk. I have I have a question about. Uh, so you mentioned the kilonovae. After the, oh, I, as far as I know, after the kilonovae, there is also the kilonovae afterglow when the material keeps expanding into the interstellar medium. And since you perform your simulations with magnetic field, you can estimate how much magnetic field energy is inside this outglow. I know that there is a common assumption that uh, the magnetic field of the expanding material is negligible, and most of the magnet uh, magnetic field that comes from uh, that is needed for this um, afterglow of the kilonovae is the gen is generated by the shock itself. But can you uh, confirm or disprove that the magnetic field of the ejecta itself is strong enough, and you do not need to uh, generate it from the interstellar medium? Okay, so I can comment that, uh, first of all, the simulation has, a, you, we have, of course, an artificial, artificial atmosphere, which is uh, also still a density that is too high to mimic, uh, really, the, the vacuum, or almost vacuum that we have around. So um, this will not allow, uh, this is not the perfect type of simulation to study the high, uh, the fast tail of our ejector. So in terms of velocity, and this velocity is important, as uh, Alessandra asked in the, in the first day and later on, because this could uh, lead to a radio uh, counterpart uh, later on. Uh, one thing that you want to know, if, if I understand correctly, is how much, how magnetized, what, what is the magnetic content of this outflow? And I, Sorry, I'm afraid your voice has disappeared. Can you please repeat? I can go plot and the total is the so I think magnetic energy is of the mass of the energy of this energy into radial kinetic motion. So that is is that the answer for your question? 
Uh, sorry, uh, for the most of your answer, the voice has disappeared. Can you please repeat uh, the, the, the key answer? Yeah, so if you can see the slide, uh, the, the energy of the outflow is for 10 to 20% magnetic energy. And I think you, you, this is one of the things you wanted to know. Mm -hmm. I think and okay. you also mentioned that the atmosphere in the simulations is too high to judge uh, the final uh, magnetization of the outflow. Yeah, so I apologize if this comes from my poor internet connection. Uh, what I was saying is that, yes, this simulation is not ideal to judge the fast tail that you have in front of your ejecta, the fast tail of your ejecta, which are important for the effect that you talk about. I see. Thank you. Okay. And the cost of slipping a little bit farther, maybe a quick question from Francois. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure it's quick. Uh, I was going to ask about <laughs> the, the growth of large scale structure of the magnetic field, uh, because I, I'm not uh, really used to think about that for the neutron star plus disk system. Uh, in the black hole system, I usually you know, think about two ways to get the large scale structure. One is to have enough flux in your initial conditions that as you accrete matter, you get the jet pretty without any need for you know a dynamo mechanism or something like that, which is I think what most simulations today have to do. Uh, and the other is to actually start you know from a from a field which is more like ten to the ten to the eleven gas and actually grow it from a dynamo mechanism. Uh, and I'm wondering if, if uh, here you know, in, in the system that you are showing uh, there is something similar in, in that um, the initial conditions in the larger field setup. Have just initial enough large scale structure from the beginning that you actually can form these these outflows, and the lower uh, magnetic field uh, setup does not. Or if there is actually a, really a growth of uh, large scale magnetic flux uh, in your simulation. So what what is shown here? So we start with the uh, magnetic fields confined inside the star. So we don't have this polar field extending outside like in uh, Ruiz and uh, Milton simulations. Uh, so all the global structure that you see along the axis is generated by the dynamics of the system. So there is an amplification and after amplification, there is a uh, magnetic winding that builds up this pressure. This pressure moves the fluid, the magnetic field goes with the fluid and this extends a poloidal field line along the axis. So uh, all uh, the helical structure that you see is generated by the dynamics of the system and this takes uh, quite a lot of time to come out. And most of this uh, is done after the, the first 50 millisecond. So after you reach the saturation of magnetic energy, which makes the magnetic field uh, uh, dynamically important. So this is really the result of the dynamics of the system, not of initial data or pre-merger conditions. Okay, thank you. Let's move on. Yeah. Thank Ricardo for his talk. And we'll... Next, hear from Phil Chang, University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. 